Good morning, everyone. Um, heard a lot about what we can do. I'm going to direct your attention to what we can. So I'm Pradeep Goal. It's an honor to be here. I'm the CEO of Solcare Foundation. We are a healthcare company. Before I jump into the company, let me talk about a little bit of a background, why I'm here. I spent my entire career in healthcare. I worked for President Bush, President Obama, the current administration in implementing healthcare policy, Medicare, Medicaid, CHIP, SNAP, TANF, VA, more acronyms than you can ever remember, as well as I've been an insurance CIO for a Blue Cross Blue Shield Association, and this is my fifth healthcare IT company over the last 25 years. Yes, I did start when I was seven, so before you ask, but <laughs> truly, this has been 26 years of building healthcare systems in the US, China, India, and abroad. I came to blockchain not because I was looking for a solution for blockchain, but rather I was searching for a solution for a problem that I've been trying to solve for a quarter century, which is how do I streamline care coordination, care administration, and care payments while maintaining integrity of the program and maintain data privacy? So how do you achieve the balance between the right amount of information being shared between people and yet maintaining patient security and GDPR and other regulations? So blockchain is not something we stumbled into. We really were looking for a way, while I was sitting in my insurance CIO's chair, how do I get rid of my 16 backend systems and how do I get them to coordinate better? And if any of you have been in healthcare on the administration side, let me give you a list of systems that we buy from the typical three-letter acronym companies. Ed eligibility, adjudication, payments, recovery, case management, disease management, care management, audit, compliance, and each of these systems is independent and typically cost me 100 to $200 million. On the last day of, last week of my job, I remember an anecdote where one of the three-letter companies walked into my office, laid a paper across the table and said, here's a deal for you, $295 million to replace your eligibility system. And it was a deal, because normally it would cost me twice as much. But this is ridiculous. Half a billion here, half a billion there, and each of these is the data silo that doesn't do the job, ultimately. So I got into blockchain because, actually because of a three-year-old. So with all my contacts in healthcare, a year ago, my then two-year-old son got diagnosed with developmental disorders. So I'm calling the CEOs of insurance companies that I work for, HMOs, PPOs, ASOs, and all those organizations. And it was a full-time job to coordinate the care of one three-year-old. So I'm thinking to myself, I have all the contacts in the world, and I can barely coordinate the care of a child. Imagine if he was terminally ill and I was a regular, a regular Joe who didn't have that Rolodex. It would be insane. It would destroy the family. So I quit. I said, enough. We're going to do something differently. So that's what brings me here. A little bit of a context. Many of you know this. You're all in DC. I grew up here. That healthcare in the US is astronomically expensive. These are 2015 numbers, 3.2 trillion. We don't know what 16 and 17 will look like, but guaranteed it'll be approaching four trillion before we know it. Where the money goes, a trillion goes to healthcare in the hospital, and the remaining 2.2 trillion is spread across a tremendous amount of players, actors. But what is really interesting is that all of this coordinate, all of this spend is not coordinated. It's all very siloed. So as an insurance exec, I had a lot of blinking lights, a big data room, thousands of IT people, but very proud of the data room walked through and showed armies of servers and computers, and so did the, the HMO next door. But you as a consumer, I don't know if you have a mainframe in your living room, I didn't. So I couldn't really compete with the siloing of data that belongs to me sitting in your control, and I'm supposed to somehow be the ultimate engaged consumer. So it really begs the question, who does the data belong to and how do I get it to work for whom it belongs to? So with that notion, I want to give you a little bird's eye view of healthcare. Everybody thinks of healthcare as complex. Yeah, it's really complex. But what you don't understand, unless you're in this market forever, is that healthcare is highly segmented. Every one of you, if you have healthcare insurance, belongs in one of these cells, only one. Either you're a PPO or an ASO or an HMO or an ACO or a, uh, some other model of care. And every one of you represents a very unique set of relationships and rules that govern your healthcare. So healthcare is highly segmented. And if you don't know how to segment it, you will find that it looks very complex and looks very, it's, it looks insane from the outside. It is because there are so many different models of care. Even within a single insurance company, we would segment the population by at least 24, 26 categories. 
whether you're a tobacco user, whether you're pre-chronic, whether you're multi-chronic, whether you have susceptibility to substance abuse, whether you need medical transportation, there are more segments of healthcare than an average person can understand, but yet you, all of you and me, belong in one segment or the other. But then what we do is we segment the population and then we build this really fancy, expensive system from your favorite Fortune 10 company, and we say to them, administer all these programs. And guess what? They don't. They only administer one-tenth of the program. They'll pick the PPO plan and say, here is a PPO system. Oh, you want HMO? That will be another $250 million, and I'm not exaggerating. Because as, a, as an administrator, whether I'm a government administrator doing Medicaid or Medicare or CHIP or VA or commercial insurance, I can't afford the number of systems. And you, we segment you faster than we can build systems. And that's the fundamental issue of complexity of healthcare. Second is data ownership. Data never really belongs to you as a patient. Either it belongs to the doctor or it belongs to the insurance company. Data ownership is defined by data residency. Whoever has the data believes they are the owner. That's not true. Data belongs to you, but just because I have it in my system, I'm gonna make you walk through, heck, through, you know, through hell to get that data from me because that's how I control the, the last mile. So we need to rethink the data relationships as well, and that's why in, in the individuals are disintermediated. And the third is, is a third-party model of payment. You go to the doctor, I pay the bill. Our relationship is orthogonal day one. Right? You want to get the best care, I want to pay the least amount. And that's not necessarily misaligned, because I do want you to be healthy. I do want you to spend the least amount of time and get back to work as quickly as possible, otherwise I'm going to write a check forever and ever. But the way we approach it is fundamentally broken. So with that said, we decided that I'm going to be my own client. We start hearing about blockchain, and I start to ask myself the question, if any of the blockchain company walks into my office and says, here, Pradeep, buy my system, what would be my first five questions? What does it do for me? What does it do for my, my population, for my providers? How does it save money? And how do I implement it using my existing systems? But don't tell me to blow up a billion dollars of CapEx that I haven't fully amortized. So we decided to build a healthcare platform with blockchain at the heart of it. But it's not really blockchain I'm worried about. I'm really focused on redefining relationships. So my vision and my team's vision is to encapsulate human relationships that govern healthcare inside blockchain. So they are transparent, they are repeatable, they are enforceable, and I can use them in any delivery model, be it self-pay, employer-paid, government-paid, hybrid, doesn't matter. We can actually redefine relationships and relationship rules and publish them in the blockchain and what it does is very something very elegant. I go to see a doctor, first thing I have to do is I call the insurance company. Well, I shouldn't have to do that. I can just review the smart contract between me and the doctor, and that is verified by that of the insurance company. Suddenly, I don't need 75 call center people doing eligibility verification every day. I'm happy as a clown, as an insurance executive. You are happy because you go to the doctor without having to call me. The doctor is happy because they don't have to verify eligibility with me, they can verify it directly with you, and they know exactly how much they're gonna get paid. So it completely changes the healthcare paradigm when we start thinking about encapsulating and publishing relationships. One thing we're not gonna do, I won't do, is to put clinical data on blockchain. I don't care what everybody's talking about, but we're not gonna stick clinical data on blockchain and pray that nobody gets hold of it. We're talking about coordinating relationships and care events, not care data. So blockchain is a great tool to coordinate entities, doctor, lab, pharmacy, specialist, caseworker, social worker, my medical reviewer, my chief medical officer, they can all coordinate without having to expose your privacy or your clinical information. So with that vision, we really are approaching healthcare as a relationship-centric model. Let's get away from system-centric administration of healthcare and let's move towards relationship-centric. It's a bold statement, but it is not orthogonal to the current model. We can implement relationship model on existing systems. We're not talking about rip and replace. We're talking about take the existing systems and enhance them to allow me to talk, allow me to facilitate patient-doctor dialogue without having to get rid of my eligibility system. So we're talking about complementary use of blockchain to truly democratize care events and care coordination. We have come up with three very singular uh, approaches to make that happen. We are first filing patent for many of these things, so, but fundamentally there is a uh, care protocol, I'll describe that. Every consumer, doctor, patient, caseworker, medical transportation, EMT, would have a care wallet on their phone, which is a container app that understands their role. 
Within each care wallet are highly personalized care cards, and this is what the community of developers around the world will publish using the protocol, not us. Healthcare is too big for any company to modernize. But what we can do is to enable the framework to allow in healthcare app store, which allows people to build an eligibility card, a payment card, a drug formulary card, a drug interaction card, a diet card, a card to manage your chronic conditions, and so on and so forth. Those cards then personalized to your care wallet. And tied to that is a payment token, not Bitcoin, but a coin that allows me to tie the actual cost of services to actual payment. So in effect, a digitized form of payment like an EFT, except it asks the question, what are you paying for? Does your relationship allow you to charge that amount? Are you charging me too much out of network cost when you should be charging me in network fees? And finally, underneath all of that is a care protocol based on blockchain, which takes every single stakeholder in healthcare and pairs them into entity pairs. So think of the three most common pairs, doctor-patient, doctor insurance, and patient insurance. That's your perfect triangle. We all can understand that triangle. That represents three entity pairs. Each entity pair has its own set of rules. It has its own set of logic and transactions and data. So we can decompose any model, be it in China, be it in US, be it in UK. Any delivery model can be decomposed into a relationship-centric healthcare delivery, sitting alongside your current legacy systems. I'm going to skip this. It's too technical. But the, the idea is, let's go ahead and take highly repetitive systems. And I have spent a lot of time in Medicaid, both in the pre-expanded Medicaid and the expansion of Medicaid. And I can tell you the amount of money that goes into IT and into fraud, waste, and abuse, or what we call overutilization, today is in excess of $100 billion a year. Let that sink in. $100 billion a year in a single program is waste and growing. And we're talking about one of dozens of programs. There is an opportunity to start transforming that by simply implementing care coordination across all the stakeholders. And that's really our vision. So last thing, solve care vision was not to say, I'm all for insurance and I don't care about the patient, or I'm all for the patient, the doctor can go pound sand. The idea is to actually have every stakeholder have a role in the ecosystem. So our vision is that a physician can publish a care card that is in alignment with their specialty around a specific care delivery protocol of diabetes or smoking or chronic, uh, chronic obesity, any number of things. And those cards are then personalized and loaded into the care wallet of a population, paid for by me, an insurance company, or you, the Medicare director, or you, the consumer, choosing to download the card because you want to get well. So we have seven defined mission statements. Healthcare cost of administration, most of you have probably heard this, is 30%. Financial cost of administration is 3%. There's an extra zero floating around here. Our goal is to bring healthcare administration cost in line with every other industry. Why can't we do it for three? It's a long, it's a long journey, but if we get there, we save this country a trillion dollars a year on the current cost model. Those are not small numbers, and that's just one country. And I've spoken about this in Russia and in China and spoken to the health minister in India. We are talking to a variety of governments, but US is home and US is the heart, so we're going to focus here. Our goal is to reduce the administrative burden on the providers. I want to get the provider doing practicing medicine 90% of the time instead of filling an EMR or an EHR or a PMS or an HIMS data entry screen because it doesn't do anything. So it's about automating all provider and uh, uh, administrative functions through care cards. It ensure accurate and timely payments. And this is a statement that may surprise you. As an insurance CIO, it was never my intention to not pay the doctor. My worry was paying too much and then having to chase, pay and chase. That was always the worry. We, we want to maintain a certain level of access to care or else we go out of business. So in that sense, insurance companies aren't orthogonal to paying doctors on time. They're simply wanting to make sure I'm not being overbilled, unbundled, overbundled, double booked, unnecessary utilization, those are the worries. So we can eliminate a lot of that through having a care event ledger that both doctor and I can share, and we don't have to argue about the basics. Um, <clears throat> make fraud, waste, and abuse very difficult. Three types of healthcare fraud. We all hear about fraud is rampant. Let me tell you what fraud really means in healthcare. Either service was delivered but not needed, or service was delivered and charged too much, or service was never delivered, right? That's it, three categories of care. That's how fraud happens. 
Either you ch charge me for something you never did, or you charge me for something you shouldn't have done, or you charge me too much for something you should, did and should have done. That's it. The reason fraud exists is because of latency between systems. By the time I get your bill, 90 days later, I have to reproduce history with the patient, with you. At some point, I just give up and pay because it is too difficult to recreate history. It's easier to just write the check or deny it, whichever way we end up going. So that recreation of history is a fundamental reason why Medicaid, Medicare, commercial insurance fraud exists. A care event ledger eliminates that. It's not a panacea, but it strikes at the heart of the problem. The last thing is bring transparency and accountability to everyone. I, as a patient, have a right to know what you're doing, even if I don't understand what you're doing. A lot of criticism that people say about healthcare is consumer doesn't want to be engaged because they don't understand medical. Well, guess what? As a lawyer, when I come ask you for legal advice, I don't need to be a lawyer to get your advice. Same way as if I want to know if my doctor, my specialist, my lab, my pharmacy are talking to each other, the fact that I know they're not talking to each other is very empowering. So I can force them to talk, as opposed to becoming a pharmacist. So we're trying to engage the consumer with care events, not with clinical expertise. And finally, last is that just from my own experience from the programs that I have personally run, managed, or built systems for, we see an opportunity to cut costs by billions a year. And that's for the cost that we all agree is a waste, such as overpayment or such as, uh, as uh, unnecessary treatments. Nobody benefits from them. End of the day, our mission is to save lives and to improve healthcare around the world. It's a very bold mission. And we, the accumulated knowledge of the last quarter century tells me that we can get there. And blockchain is an important technology that we see getting us there. Final statement, it's not ready. The blockchain stack isn't built. SOA stack wasn't built 10, 20 years ago when I started to adopt SOA in my organization. Blockchain stack isn't built either. It will get built. That's not the worry. The worry is to make sure that we find good use cases and we engage the right stakeholders who want to adopt it. That's the mission of Solve Care, and I appreciate you all listening. Thank you. Thank you.